April 9th, 2015. We leave Vancouver Island, bound for Unalaska in the Aleutian Islands. Ahead lie some 2,600 nautical miles of open ocean and uninhabited islands. Despite our early season start, the mountains are almost bare of snow, less than we have seen in July in previous years. In Juneau, the docks are strangely empty. The streets deserted and traffic free. The first cruise ship is not due for another three weeks. Moorage is plentiful and the harbour silent with the absence of float planes. The forecast is good for the Gulf of Alaska, but we encounter strong local winds en route to Cape Spencer, which marks the entrance to the Gulf. Once outside in open water, the weather is fair. The skyline dominated by the coastal mountains. The only traffic, gargantuan barges towed by diminutive tugs. Kayak Island is a prominent landmark of historic significance. Our first real stopping point is Cordova in Prince William Sound. We were last here in 2013, but have returned this time for the Bird Festival, celebrating the annual northward migration of millions of birds, especially western sandpipers, whose main nesting area is the Yukon. These tiny birds have flown around 200 miles per day to reach here from San Francisco, or in some cases, even as far as South America. After a couple of weeks and a farewell from some friendly otters, we continue west across Prince William Sound. We pass the Stella Sea Lion Hall out on the Needles. We go next to the fjords on the Kenai Peninsula. We anchor in aptly named Ribbon Fall Cove, surrounded by magnificent waterfalls. following morning in perfect weather. We follow Granite Passage to the Northwest Glacier at its head. We nudge our way through the ice careful to steer clear of ice floes on which harbour seals are pupping. Our new drone provides a unique viewpoint, hitherto denied us. Cataract Cove is too deep and rocky to permit anchoring, but allows us to move close to waterfalls with deep water beneath our keel. Taking advantage of a short weather window, we make the crossing to Kodiak on the island of the same name. Unlike Canada, fish farms are banned in Alaska. Commercial fishing is flourishing, and the harbors are crammed with well-maintained fishing boats. Venture is one of just a handful of recreational vessels. Pillar Mountain, overlooking Kodiak, has six windmills and provides a good viewpoint over the city and the surrounding islands. The best views over the city of Kodiak are from the top of Pillar Mountain. Nestled at its foot, the airport is vulnerable to bad weather. There are several roads leading out of town. Although they ultimately all dead end, they run further than most roads in this part of the world.
we take a drive and encounter a herd of buffalo. and this rather beautiful fox, who is reluctant to move off the road. We pass the aerospace launch complex. This sign means what it says. We later learn that a few months earlier, a rogue rocket had to be destroyed four seconds after takeoff, leaving quite a mess. We explore Fossil Beach. We don't find any fossils, but the tortured landscape with its jumble of fractured rocks is clear evidence of Kodiak's violent volcanic heritage. Few outside this area, including ourselves, are aware of the cataclysmic eruption which occurred on the Katmai Peninsula in 1912. Nova Raptor was 10 times stronger than the eruption of Mount Helens seen here on the left of this diagram, and injected twice as much matter as the 1883 explosion of Krakatoa. The city of Kodiak was smothered in a cloud of ash so dense a lantern held at arm's length could not be seen. In places the ash was head high. Following the eruption, thousands of steaming fumaroles created what came to be known as the Valley of Ten Thousand Smokes. Even today, ash can clearly be seen on the mountain slopes in Katmai. On Good Friday, 1964, Alaska was struck by a monster earthquake, generating huge tsunamis which caused widespread destruction. In Kodiak, everything below the orange line in this picture was devastated. Vital fish processing facilities were wiped out so a World War II Liberty ship was brought out of retirement to act as a temporary processing plant. It still serves that purpose today. In 1989, exactly 25 years later, also on Good Friday, Kodiak suffered another calamity when the Exxon Valdez ran aground in Prince William Sound. This disaster devastated the fishing industry upon which Kodiak depends for its survival. We attend a balalaika recital by a local group in the Baranov Museum, an original Russian structure dating from 1810. Kodiak has a number of interesting museums, including the National Wildlife Center, which features a skeleton of this grey whale, which washed up on a local beach. From Kodiak we cross Shelikov Strait to Geographic Harbor in Katmai National Park on the Alaskan Peninsula. What at first glance appear to be patches of dirty snow on the flanks of the surrounding mountains is ash from the enormous eruption of Nova Rupta on June the 6th, 1912.
Bears here are protected from hunting, so, unlike most of Alaska, they do not flee at the sight of humans. Taking the tender, we observe 16 bears in one day, including this mother with three cubs. The light-colored bear in this twosome is a female who chased away a rival to flirt with a dark-colored male. Another pair along the beach appear ambivalent about our presence. In this short video, it is hard to convey the nature of this raw and untamed land. Much appears untouched and unvisited, and most undoubtedly has never encountered a human footstep. On almost every island where the coast meets the sea, it is as if some cataclysmic force has sheared off the land, creating fissured and shattered cliffs. In the Atlantic, these would be home to millions of shrieking birds, but here, there's hardly a one. Ugalashak Island is a rare exception. No prizes for guessing why this headland is named Castle Cape. We anchor in the northern arm of Castle Bay, where jagged spires draped with mist rise sheer 3,600 feet from the water. Our next anchorage, American Bay, is almost as dramatic. Our next stop is Sand Point, another town entirely dependent upon fishing and fish processing. As usual, the harbour is dominated by commercial fish boats. George joins us here, and we put him to work filleting the salmon, so generously provided by friendly locals. Checking the weather and following the advice of the coast pilot are vital for safe navigation. The weather over the Bering Sea is generally bad and very changeable. Good weather is the exception and does not last for long. Wind shifts are frequent and rapid. The summer season has much fog and considerable rain. In early winter the gales increase, the fogs lessen and snow is likely at any time after mid-September. Winter is the time of almost continuous storminess. Much of this area has only been partially surveyed and the charts must not be relied upon too closely, especially near shore. The currents are much influenced by the winds and are difficult to predict. Dead reckoning is uncertain and safety depends upon constant vigilance. We delay our departure by one day, but the seas remain boisterous. Volcanoes are visible on the main. 
We spend one night in Volcano Bay with catabatic winds gusting in excess of 40 knots. As dawn comes up like thunder, apocalyptic clouds loom overhead, driven by the unabated wind. We pass south of Unimac Island under the shadow of its magnificent volcanoes. We have reached the Aleutians. We turn into Dora Harbour seeking shelter from the blustery conditions and are soon joined by 30 small fishing boats. Again we are presented with salmon so fresh they had been swimming one hour previously. They provide a delicious meal. We spend a peaceful evening in pastoral surroundings. We leave the Gulf of Alaska at Unimac Pass and enter the Bering Sea. We stop for the night in beautiful English Bay on Unalaska Island. The surrounding hills appear clothed with green velvet in the soft evening light. In the far distance we can see snow-capped Progromny Volcano on Unimac Island. Priest Rock points the way to our ultimate destination. In terms of pounds of seafood landed, Dutch Harbour is the largest port in the whole of the United States. Actually, its correct name is Unalaska, with Dutch just being one of several harbours. We visit Fort Schwatka atop Ballyhoo Mountain to tour the remains of World War II fortifications. This photo was taken in 1942. The view from the top shows Dutch Harbour, contained within the spit of land in the foreground, with the town of Unalaska in the distance. Venture proves too large to fit in the small marina near town, so we relocate to Carl Moses Boat Harbour, surrounded this time by even larger commercial vessels. There are excellent facilities, although only 100 amp shore power is available. We are now 2,603 nautical miles from our starting point. Unalaska is between fishing seasons. Everywhere are enormous stockpiles of refrigerated containers. Many, like these, brand new awaiting the bounty of salmon. Elsewhere are stacks of crab pots like those featured in the TV series Deadliest Catch. Unalaska bears absolutely no resemblance to the impression gained from this program. Eagles are everywhere. We are warned never to look up if dive bombed by an eagle. Would you want these talons to rake your face? and you wouldn't want to tangle with this guy. A strange cubic sculpture decorates the downtown waterfront close to the first-class Grand Aleutian Hotel. Here too is a Russian Orthodox church with adjacent graveyard. There are a number of roads to drive including this one which, like so many, owes its origin to the military from World War II. Fog is always lurking and liable to disrupt aircraft movements at the downtown airport.
The ever-present mist closes in as we prepare to leave Unalaska and head east. At one of the two fuel docks in town, we take on 1,000 gallons of diesel. They tell us they dispense 1 million gallons per week at this facility. We head for the offshore baby islands to see whiskered auklets found only here or in the furthest reaches of the Aleutian Islands. Venture is buffeted by strong currents and visibility is limited. Bizarre shapes loom out of the gloom. The vapors that hang in the air are not just mist, but steam arising from the shore of Hot Springs Bay, where we anchor for the night. We take the small tender to the black volcanic shore, from which steam arises. Chris measures the temperature of the sand using an infrared thermometer. It reads 138 degrees Fahrenheit. Unknown to us, we are being watched from the dense vegetation lining the shore. This fox exhibits more curiosity than fear, which is a pleasant change. The volcanic sand is strewn with flotsam and jetsam. It is really quite surprising what fetches up on the beach while Venture swings at her anchor. When we attempt to cross Unimac Pass, the combination of the strong southerly wind and opposing current produces turbulent seas. We are in no hurry and we turn back to await better conditions. The following day the weather improves and we try again. We pass along the northern Bering Sea shore of Unimac Island, whose magnificent volcanoes reach above our heads into the sky. We await a rising tide before attempting to navigate through Isonotsky Strait. Navigating the shallows at this northern end means paying close attention to the markers. The channel narrows in the south at the location of the small town of False Pass on Unimac Island. Across the strait, a few mostly derelict structures cling to the green slopes forming the tip of the Alaskan Peninsula. Continuing east, we meet the research vessel Qualifier en route to Nome. The weather turns menacing and the wreck of a grounded fishboat is a reminder that this is no place for the unwary. We visit King Cove, another small town dependent entirely on fishing. The harbour is almost deserted when we arrive, as the fishing fleet takes advantage of a scheduled opening. Not required when at sea, fenders and lines remain on the docks. Overnight the fleet returns and once again the harbour is filled with boats. We go next to Captain's Harbour where, to our surprise, we find two sailing yachts already at anchor. We are unused to sharing an anchorage with another boat. We more venture well away so as not to intrude but launched the tender to pay them a visit. Orca has a crew from Germany and Sweden and Santana from Holland. We learn that they have both reached here from Northern Europe by way of the Straits of Magellan and the South Pacific. Along the shore we see a pair of eagles and this family of bears. We invite the crews on the yachts for dinner aboard Venture. The wind is gusting to 40 knots, and as we have the more powerful tender, 
Chris runs the gauntlet to collect our guests. The conditions make for a rough ride. Enjoy a pleasant evening on board. The plotter shows how much venture swings to her anchor overnight. At dawn, the winds continue unabated, keeping the bow aligned with the chain while retrieving the anchor is quite a challenge. Once underway, we pass a large barge being towed by a tiny tug with supplies for Unalaska. Our next anchorage is Dolgoy Harbor, overlooked by Pavlov Volcano and its associated peaks. From there, we take a look at Canoe Bay, where, at midnight and with no fanfare, an overcast and rainy day blossoms into a rose pink and flaming sunset. Venture's electronic screens clearly show the narrow entrance which needs to be navigated at slack tide. We continue east. We are treated to views of Pavlov Volcano. And wonderful cloudscapes. The southern tip of Unger Island features towering cliffs. This is a land forged in fire with shapes and colours that reflect its violent volcanic past. We visit groups of offshore rocks. Sea lion rocks are a haul out for stellar sea lions whose numbers have dropped precipitously in recent years. We see one trapped in a chokehold necklace of carelessly discarded garbage. We later report this finding to the authorities in Sand Point. The Kenoi's basalt columns give rise to towering pinnacles and unique rock formations. Oh wow, it's a big hole. See the hole there? Yeah, around the further I am. Yeah. Uh, and look at this whole bird. We are now in the Shumagin Islands, named after Nikita Shumagin, a Russian sailor who died on August the 29th, 1741. The devastating oil spill from the Exxon Valdez reached within just a few miles of here to approximately where the name Shumagin appears on this map. We anchor in Pirate's Trace on Nagai Island. Flocks of seabirds dive in waters rich with fish.
The islands appear to float on glass. We later meet a fisherman who tells us he's never seen such conditions in 40 years. The calm continues as we visit haystacks, a rugged group of rocks home to millions of birds. Tufted puffins abound along this coast. They duck dive as you approach, scoot past with frantic wing beats, and are almost impossible to photograph. Using the tender, we tour the rocks at the entrance to Delaroff Harbour on Unger Island. There has to be some special mud in this location that attracts these flocks of gulls which vanish abruptly whenever a hawk appears overhead. We visit the abandoned town of Unger. Leaving Venture anchored beyond the rocky headland, we take the tender ashore and are greeted by a curious river otter. We follow the remains of the wooden path and walk among the ruins. It is sad to see the decay of a once prosperous town. This is a photo of the Apollo gold mine, which peaked in 1904. Most inhabitants moved to Sand Point on nearby Popoff Island, a few miles away. The last family left in 1969. We anchor in Barilof Bay, also on Unger Island, where there is an abandoned cannery. We find a sea star clinging to the chain when we haul in the anchor. We now revisit Sand Point, having previously spent time here on our outbound trip. Again, the harbour is full of fishing boats, understandably, being the day before the 4th of July, there is no fish opening. We are surprised to see so many cruising boats. There are Orca and Santana we have already met, a Nordhaven 46 called Four Seasons, based in Seward. Let's Go is a sailboat which has sailed up the Aleutian chain from Japan. Another sailboat, Rose, is on the last leg of a world circumnavigation before returning to her home port of Unalaska. 
On the workboat side there is Seymour, built in 1913 and still fishing with her Polish captain. Our next guest, Steve, is joining us here, but the stunning weather we have enjoyed abruptly changes, and for three days flights from Anchorage are delayed due to poor visibility, driving rain and strong winds. We have time to meet with our fellow cruisers and visit local restaurants with cute decor. The 4th of July parade consists mostly of tastefully decorated kids' bikes. I visit the old Russian graveyard where colorful wildflowers and a sea of white daisies dance in the wind. Clouds continue to hang low over the islands as we leave Sand Point and head east for a return visit to dramatic Castle Cape and Castle Bay. We have little hope of seeing the peaks, but much to our surprise and delight, the veil is drawn aside and they are revealed to us in all their glory. Their lower slopes clothed in emerald green. Leaving Castle Cape, we pass towering peaks and bizarre sea stacks. We anchor off Sutwick Island and go ashore onto a beach littered with logs. The nearest trees are hundreds of miles from here and their bleached skeletons bear the scars of many months at sea. Some are riddled with the burrows of Torito worms. Piles of kelp clutter the beach, along with some man-made debris. bright orange starfish lies stranded on the volcanic sand. We are surprised to see bare footprints on this island, which lies so distant from the mainland. We keep a wary lookout, being especially careful of entering caves like the one on the right, but we see no bears. 
wildflowers sprout from crevices in the rocks. The sailing yacht Santana has joined us here. We say farewell to Jan and Trace as they now plan to follow an alternative route. Sunrise floods the landscape and Santana in golden light. sides are draped in a mantle of soft green velvet. Across the Shelikov Strait we can see the volcanoes and snow-capped mountains on the distant Alaska Peninsula. The strait is in a state of rare calm and we see many whales in the distance. Dull dolphins explode from the water but do not stay long. The southern extremity of Kodiak Island appears on the horizon. Following a tip from another cruiser, we are heading towards the Ocean Beauty Cannery in Lazy Bay. As we approach, we disturb a blizzard of gulls. We anchor in the bay and go ashore to the Alatak Packing Company, established in 1917 and employing some 200 people. Most are seasonal workers from around the world. This Hollywood sign on the hillside is an example of the whimsy that is a feature of this place. We go to meet the manager, Woody Keeble. His office is a virtual museum with shelves laden with photos, fossils, bones and artifacts accumulated from 20 years of local beachcombing. These include this beautiful and rare example of Scrimshaw. Woody offers us a tour of the facility, which is immaculate. He takes us to his unofficial museum, which houses items too large to fit into his office. These include a hundred-year-old wooden fishing dory, and tools from years past, many salvaged from abandoned canneries. A few steam ovens remain for limited canning, although most of the processing these days is done by refrigeration. We are photographed framed by the jawbone of a fin whale. Alitak even has its own mini national park populated by skinny, bizarre characters. This one is clearly a guy. Even the bike rack has its own whimsical style. Woody has created a small, non-denominational chapel to meet the needs of transient people 
of many faiths and beliefs. We are invited to enjoy a tasty lunch at the plant and we reciprocate by inviting Woody for a meal aboard Venture. The following morning finds us crammed among commercial fishing boats alongside battle-scarred pilings where Woody has kindly agreed for us to take on some fuel. Having discharged her load, the tender Nighthawk heads out once more to act as a link between Alitak and local fishermen. The season lasts five months and we later learn that the total for 2015 is an astounding 20 million pounds of salmon. An almost incredible figure for this one facility, given that Alaska fisheries are rigorously monitored to ensure that the catch is sustainable. Current's free. We head through the narrows into Olga Bay. We drop anchor in front of some derelict buildings. The bay is home to many set netters who live ashore in houses backed by hillsides so green they would dazzle a leprechaun. One end of the net is attached to the land and the other to a float in the water. Trapped salmon are collected and delivered to a tender which takes them to Alatak. This is a seasonal occupation and when not involved in fishing, set netters may be university professors or living as far away as Cape Town. Our plan had been to follow the west coast of Kodiak Island and make the acquaintance of some of these interesting folk before recrossing the Shelikov Strait for a second visit to Geographic. But when we come to raise the anchor in front of this abandoned cannery, the winch quits. Fortunately, not until after the anchor clears the water. Chris and Steve work on the problem under cover, but the motor is shot. Without the winch, we have no choice but to head directly up the east coast to Kodiak, 125 miles away. We pass the spot where the shell platform Kulak broke free from its tow in waves exceeding 50 feet and ran aground in the early hours of 2013. We have no trouble identifying the exact location using this photograph and comparing it with the chart. There is a fish opening and the harbour is almost empty when we arrive. Our misfortune with the windlass has put us ahead of Determined not to allow our problem with the windlass to deprive us of another bear encounter, we take a charter flight down to the southern end of the island.
At the Seahawk facility, we are kitted out in thigh-length waders before boarding our float plane. Our pilot takes us down the east coast over Three Saints Bay. The view from the air emphasizes the ruggedness of the shoreline. It is certainly not one you want to bump into on a dark night. We fly over some of the same areas we had traversed by boat and onto Dog Salmon Creek and Fraser Lake, where we land and wade ashore. How's your owl on set? If anybody else uses a restroom too, there's an outhouse up there. If you're a guy, I recommend just coming behind that building. <laughs> to reach the fish pass, we need to hike about three quarters of a mile along a muddy track, which to judge from this footprint, is also a bare highway. Until the fish ladder was constructed in 1962, salmon were backpacked individually, one at a time, past the falls and into the lake. Two mother bears, each with two cubs, are trying their best to snag salmon with limited success. Actually, the mother is doing all the hard work, while the cubs prefer the salad bar. This scruffy looking male caused family groups to keep well clear of him, but he will be chilly in the winter unless he acquires a better coat. All fish coming up into the lake are monitored and counted. Close to one half million salmon from Fraser Lake contribute to the overall harvest in this area. We return to Kodiak along the west coast of the island. We pass deep fjords, notorious for their fierce catabatic winds, known as willy wars. We skirt high mountains and magnificent scenery. The flight provides a unique overview of this rugged island. Back in Kodiak, the wind is blowing and the rain arrives just in time to interfere with the installation of the new motor, which has been flown up from Vancouver Island.
The next morning we take on 1,285 gallons of diesel at one of the fuel docks. With our tanks full, we bid farewell to Kodiak, but being still ahead of schedule and with a favorable weather window coming up, we take time to visit the islands just to the north of the main island. We pull into Saposa Bay on Afognik Island, much to the annoyance of this very vocal sea otter who objects to our presence. This rocky outcrop teems with wildlife, including seals, tufted puffins, and kittiwakes. We next take the big tender up a shallow river. We go ashore and hike beneath trees draped with primordial moss. Along the trail we see wild roses and horsetail plants described as living fossils unchanged for millions of years. We fortify ourselves with salmon berries. We meet Jen at the weir where she and her partner count returning sockeye salmon. Even removing individual scales, which like tree rings can be used to determine the age of the fish from which they came. They're all sockeye. Fireweed is just starting to bloom, heralding the end of summer. From here, our route takes us across the very heart of the Gulf of Alaska. For such an exposed ocean crossing, a suitable weather window is imperative. We arise early and secure the galley for sea, making good use of our multi-purpose potholders. At 5 a.m., under a beautiful dawn, we forsake the land and strike out directly across the Gulf to Sitka. 560 nautical miles distant. The day closes with a glorious sunset. We are 150 miles from the nearest land, but consisting entirely of remote and rugged islands, not the sort of land to which you would want to get too close. We run watches of two hours on and six hours off. Following seas make for a comfortable ride aboard Venture with her hard chines and long keel. We make landfall at Salisbury Sound on the mainland and anchor in Sukhoi Inlet at noon on the second day having covered 560 nautical miles after 55 hours, 34 minutes underway. We decide not to head directly to Sitka, but pass down Neva Strait 
and through Whitestone Narrows into De Groff Bay for our second night. Overnight the rain departs and we make our way to the offshore Santa Lazaria Islands, home to over half a million breeding seabirds. Prominent Mount Edgecombe is totally devoid of snow, as are all the mountains this year. We anchor in an unnamed bay on the south side of Magoon Island and use the tender to explore nooks and crannies. Finally, it is time for us to make our way to Sitka. Although the area had been settled by the Tlingit for thousands of years, the present town was founded by the Russians in 1804 with the name of New Archangel. When purchased by the US in 1867, it was renamed and until 1906 was the state capital. Venture looks quite at home between two working boats. It will take another 10 days to cover the remaining 600 miles to our starting point on Vancouver Island. When we finally arrive, we will have covered 5,000 nautical miles over a period of four months. <laughs> 